Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the last show before we begin Holocaust Week on Thursday. And we are back to Burma. Uh, we had a Burma week earlier in the year. We've done a couple of shows here and there about campaigns in Burma and that part of the world, New Guinea as well. But we're back to Burma. And my guest today is an artist, an author. She appears on TV and all the time talking about current affairs in Myanmar. She's traveled extensively through the region. She understands it. She understands the people. And she, a few weeks ago, contacted me with a view to discussing OSS Detachment 101. And I said, great. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest. She's in California, Edith Morant. So uh, good afternoon or good morning for you. How are you doing, Edith? Terrific. Thanks so much for having me. I loved uh, every moment of Burma Week. And um, now I'm kind of one of the stragglers coming out of the jungle of Burma Week to discuss one more amazing unit that uh, did long range penetration missions and much more during the war there. Well, and I, I, we, I can't wait to hear about it. But before we dive into the presentation, you know, I gave a little bit of a game away there in my introduction, but you have Myanmar, that area of the world is is very close to you. You've traveled there, you've lived there. So um, what, what, simple question, but perhaps a long answer, what, what do you love about that area of the world? Um, it's an extraordinarily diverse country. Um, the geology to the, the ethnic groups, there's an amazing array of interesting people and places there. And in the early um, 1980s, I was living in Northern Thailand, painting and eating Thai food. And someone said, do you want to go up to the border, which is the border of Burma? And I found out that as beautiful and perhaps uh, you know, literary a country as it was from Orwell or Somerset Mom, it was also a country under a brutal, brutal dictatorship. And my work started to be um, getting stories out of there that people would tell me in first person interviews about what was going on. And that entailed going into the war zone, the ongoing war zone there. Um, first the Thai border and then Thailand um, disinvited me. And then the other borders of Burma, which included the China border where the Kachin people are, and uh, going on some long marches with their soldiers in the 90s, and then returning there repeatedly um, during the course of the war up into the 21st century. So it's an area where, in many ways, World War II is still going on. The same players are there only without the superpowers of the day. A little bit like you might see in Afghanistan now, where certain ethnic groups allied with certain people certain um, political interests were arranged and then it all stops and ends, but the war itself, the conflict continues. And uh, I remember being up in a bamboo hut in the northern part of Burma in the Kachin state at one point. They used to call those huts bashas in the OSS or the Chindits. Um, so there I was in the basha, you know, in an overcoat because it's cold up in the mountains. And I was listening to shortwave radio to the Voice of America, which is what you used to do back in the 90s. And they had the jazz hour. And the jazz hour started playing Glenn Miller. And so I thought, well, time travel really does exist. So I was back in my parents' generation, basically, in northern Burma with a war still going on. And I think that's a that's a great um, reference there then to, to say that the war is still going on, because one of the things I've been saying on my tours in Normandy for a long time is that in many ways, very few of the participant, nation, participant nations in World War II actually saw immediately the results of that victory. I mean, countries in Europe have to rebuild. Russia has another how many decades of, of communism. Most of Eastern Europe has another few more decades of Eastern of communism. Um, Yugoslavia, same thing, difficult situation. And, def and, and the Middle East, I mean, let's not forget the Middle East. That went very bad for, for, for a while um, and, and still has its issues. And so, you know, so many of the viewers of World War II TV, if we're lucky enough to come from countries like the UK, USA, Canada, Australia, we think of World War II correctly ending in 1945. But actually, as you said there, in many areas, Myanmar, and particularly 
the conflict just carried on in a different shape under a different name under a different kind of banner but the, the same the same issues are deeply there and and that's why it's important to that the today's show is is looking at history but it's also topical it's also it's also got this current relevance i mean i'd be interested later on in the show to have your tell as have you explain your projects you're involved with today in burma but anyway back back to world war ii to begin with so um yeah, as you said there, the OSS is one of the many players out there. And I just to point out, Richard Duckett is watching, who was with us in Burma Week talking about the SOE. So the SOE, kind of the British organized subversive intelligence unit out in the Far East. And the OSS is the American version of the same thing. Although, of course, they did, as Edith will explain, kind of work together. There's shared, shared goals, shared um, um, operations like that. So I will hand over to you to kind of explain things, uh, get things kicked off, Edith. And as usual, folks, if you've got questions or comments, far away, I'll put them in. And if I have questions I have for Edith, I will interrupt her during the during the course of the show. But basically, Edith, over to you. Uh, let's let's get the ball rolling with OSS and uh, Detachment One Hundred One. Thanks, Paul. Um, as you'll see in this picture and other pictures, it was truly a multi-ethnic force. Um, of course, it was under the United States um, leadership and devised by them. But um, there were really only about 700 Americans involved. Most of them were support and training staff in Assam in India. And uh, only about 200 ended up being inserted into Burma. And then in contrast, at the height of Detachment 101, um, there were over 10,000 local troops involved in the operations. Um, the insignia with the big USA on it was actually kind of after the fact. It was like very late in the game. They decided, well, maybe people would like something like this. And they put it together. But for most of the war, um, they were pretty irregular in um, presentation and uh, the Americans wore Gurkha hats with a peacock feather in it, like as a, a token insignia, if, if any insignia. So the next slide. So here's a nice map of Burma, um, Northern Burma anyway, showing the mountainous terrain and the great river valleys going through it. Um, it was a British colony when the Japanese invaded in 1942, there was a mass evacuation um, there's a big picture of Wingate, of the Chindits on the map. There's also a smaller picture of Stilwell, who was the American commander, who was uh, Lieutenant General put in charge of the whole China-Burma-India theater. And his major goal was resupplying Chinese um, troops to fight the Japanese there, one way or another, whether it was flying over what they called the hump of the Himalayas or building a road to get there. So this was a big goal. And um, to get things happening in the US Army there, you really had to convince Stillwell of um, something was a good idea. So next slide. And and Stillwell, we've, we've discussed him before on the show. Stillwell, uh, despite his kind of reservations about working with different nations he does kind of understand the area he does has a have a grasp of 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 the linguistic side of things and and like like um slim later in the campaign they are they are uh they're, they're sympathetic to the region aren't they they're they're not they're sort of because they've been posted there, they genuinely have an, a, an appreciation to some level of, of the locals and what, the, what the, the history of the country is like. Is that fair to say? Well, it was firsthand in Burma for Stilwell, of course, because he walked out famously during the evacuation. And um, one of his impressions he took with him was that it would be a really, really good idea to have um, intelligence forces dedicated to gathering intelligence and radioing it out from inside Burma. Um, this is something that um, 136 of the SOE was already kind of doing. And um, this would be an American sort of version of that. So Stillwell worked with uh, Brigadier General Wild Bill Donovan, the colorful head of the Operation of Strategic Services, the OSS, to devise this thing. And Stillwell knew an even more colorful person named um, 
uh, Carl Eifler, um, who had been in law enforcement in Hawaii, and they picked him to be in charge of this new Detachment 101. Um, Eifler cast a net for really, really smart people with languages who knew the region well. So um, it wasn't just anybody could join this mysterious thing they were starting. Um, they had engineers, radio technicians. There was a watchmaker for his technological ability. There was some guy who had worked with a warlord as an advisor in China at some point. Um, there were Asian Americans. There were people who were used to tropical um, environments from Hawaii. So it was quite a variety and there were, there were not that many of them. There were a few dozen at the beginning. And the emphasis was to base in Assam in Northeast India and recruit people from Burma to join this, um, whether they were refugees or they'd been in law enforcement or the army in Burma, or they'd worked in logging or mining. So there were Burmese, there were Anglo-Burmese, Chinese Burmese, and then a variety of ethnic groups, including the Kachins, who we'll talk about a lot, um, Karens. There were even some people from Thailand. There were Gurkhas who were, had been living in Burma. So it was a multi-multi-ethnic force from the very beginning. And uh, training started in 1942, kind of mid-1942. Next slide. And um, there were already uh, Kachins like Zing Tana who were fighting the Japanese. There were the Kachin levies who were um, the British led force. And the Kachin people are mountain people. They speak a language related to Burmese and Tibetan. Um, Kachin is a kind of amalgamation of several tribes. They also live on the China side of the border. And they were pretty aware of what the Japanese had done to people in China. They also just straight out didn't like intruders, whether they were bandits from China or kind of anybody else. They um, I described their relationship with the British colonists as a spear point detente. Um, as long as both of them kind of left each other alone, everything would be OK. Um, they kind of immediately got along well with the Americans. Um, so it was a partnership and often a really strong friendship. Um, they oh, and would you, sorry, the, sorry to interrupt you, Edith, but would, would you say that that was an immediately a bit of an advantage for the US forces there because yeah. they don't have a vested interest <laughs> in the region? And the British, of course, because of colonial, the, the empire, there is this sense of exactly at what cost it'll be you know we, we know that with the british involvement with the armies in india is that there's 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 a sometimes a conflict of interest although nobody likes the japanese and everybody sees the japanese as the greater enemy there's a there's this level of suspicion and rivalry that goes back generations whereas the us are, are essentially new players in the theater so therefore they they're although they're treated, as you say, as outsiders, they're outsiders without that baggage. So so do you think that was to the US advantage? They came to it pretty fresh, but with expertise. Um, William Pierce, who would later become commander of 101, uh, describes his first meeting with Eifler when he was being recruited as Eifler slamming a dagger into a desk to make a point. But then, um, going on a wide ranging elucidation of the entire socio-political situation in Asia for, you know, for hours afterwards. So they, they really valued a kind of intellectual depth in the organization. Um, the Kachins were largely Christian because of American Baptist missionaries. Um, so that kind of helped the case for the Americans too. They had you know, a positive association with the Americans. Next. Um, so the very first infiltrations were in 1943. They didn't go very well. Um, they came in you know, with a dozen people and a mule convoy and um, Pierce described it as the circus coming to town. <laughs> it was it was just way too high profile. So after that, they really specialized in parachute drops. 
Um, there were hundreds of parachute drops, um, most of which were Kachins going back into Burma. And they had the, the fantastic statistic of zero casualty from parachute jumps during the war. Wow. Uh, so that shows, um, I don't know, good training, good equipment. Um, once they got down, you could sell the parachute um, or trade the parachute cloth to local people for for food or other supplies. They also brought in um, silver coins and um, a little more controversially later on, opium was um, a well-known trade good in the region at the time. Um, tobacco could get you, you know, what you needed from local people too. So uh, they really, they would set up relationships immediately. There, these would be little teams of three or four that would parachute in at a time and then just work their networks for intelligence. Next. So the Kachins, um, you know, they're, the, la the previous pictures were Kachins being trained in radios and parachutes. Those were things they didn't know, but they knew everything else. They knew how to survive in the jungle absolutely from childhood. And these are things they taught the Americans and the other foreigners and the city people who were involved in the conflict alongside them. Um, they guided units. Um, they acted as scouts for um, other long range penetration. They taught you how to survive in the jungle. And um, I guess their famous word, uh, punji, has, you know, uh, had staying power in weaponry. Um, during World War II, the punji stakes were often used as uh, an ambush enhancement. Um, there would be a Japanese patrol going through a forest path and they would be attacked from deep inside a bamboo grove. And then they would, as they rush to get away from it, be impaled on these um, poisoned, sharpened bamboo stakes. Um, when I was in the area where the Kachin Independence Army was fighting the Burmese dictatorship much later in the 1990s, that's what that picture is from, um, punji stakes were very much in use in a defensive um, position. Um, this is Padang Khan the frontline base that I described as bristling like a porcupine. Mm. So they could be used both ways. I mean, you're kind of fighting with sticks and stones, but um, could be highly effective. Next. So another um, aspect of what 101 did was rescuing um, downed air crews. Um, Robert Lyman has written about what it, what it was like for people to crash in this remote area. And if you had any hope of being rescued, it would be by the local people. And so 101 would kind of lay the groundwork for that. They also gave survival training to the air crews. Um, and so they did over 400 um, uh, crew members. And also there were civilian um, uh, uh, passengers involved. And in gratitude, then the Air Force gave them some airplanes, including a really flimsy um, gypsy moth biplane, which 250 pound um, Eichler, himself, Eichler himself would, would fly on occasion. Um, he did a really reckless thing and took Donovan, the head of the OSS, over enemy lines in that terrible little plane at some point. The ramifications of um, Donovan being captured would have been truly mm. horrible. Mm. Um, but uh, they also um, got a hold of a helicopter at one point, kind of late in the game. And it might have been the first time a helicopter was used to insert agents. Um, helicopters had been used for medevac prior to that, but this was, uh, and it, it was a kind of a one-time. Yeah, they were very thin on the ground, weren't they, helicopters? We, we, but both sides, did, well, did have them in World War II, very yeah. towards the, the late stages, but they were very experimental. But yeah, oh, and by the way, folks, Robert Lyman is coming on in, I forget which week it's going to be now, but he is going to be talking about the OSS and the rescue of people from a particular crash. That's one of the shows I've got lined up for, I think it's October. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I'm trying to think when it is now. My brain is not is not is not allowing me to, to, to remember when it is. But he's definitely coming on at some point to talk about that. Yeah, there were there were little bits of use of you know submarines and helicopters, and then they would ditch it. You know, as the David Foster Wallace put it, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. Um, but they were just extremely adaptive and flexible um, as an organization, Detachment 101. Next. So there were, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a couple hundred Americans who, who got inserted, you know, as well as the many, many local troops. Um, this picture, that's Sam Spector, and then that's him again in the uh, more recent um, 20th first century picture. And next to him is a monument um, that was made by a Kachin sculpture showing a, an American OSS um, person and a Kachin OSS person. Um, this was controversial at the time. The dictatorship didn't appreciate it. They arrested the sculptor. Um, copies of the statue ended up in the river. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but this one um, remains at the United States Embassy in um, Yangon or Rangoon, the biggest city in Burma, um, as at least a token of appreciation of basically each other, the Kachins and the Americans who, who fought with them. And when you sent me the PowerPoint uh, a few few weeks ago and I looked at that photo, Edith, it did. I really liked that statue because to me it symbolized the the level level of cooperation and respect between the, the the American officers and the Kachin people on the ground because we do know in World War II there are forces that send allies send people into places where their treatment of and their respect for the locals is perhaps not as high as it should be and it's them telling these people who've been living there for generations what to do and how to do it and already when you're explaining about the Kachins, explaining about how to live into the jungle, live in the jungle, and how to how to how to live there, it seems immediately that particularly the OSS, and I'm sure Richard Duckett would would comment on the SOE as well. Our, our understanding this is only going to work if we're working on a level basis with these locals and we're taking on their ideas and understanding what they've got to offer. And that, to me, that statue symbolizes that. That's that's two people of, of of equal respect for each other. I know I'm reading a lot into just a statue that I never actually visit seen, but that's what I see in that. It's a it's cooperation between two forces. And uh, and it was made by a Kachin sculptor, and the Kachin is showing the way in it. Um, there were a few of the um, 101 officers who were abusive, and you know, kind of went Colonel Kurtz uh, up and <laughs> wherever they were. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, they really did learn from and live with the local people in a really respectful way. Next. Uh, so not only um, were they in northern Burma, they were they they spread out. Um, this is the handy pocket map of Burma that was in the pocket guide to Burma that U.S. troops got. Um, so over there by Bay of Bengal is Arakan, um, which Lucy spoke about in um, Burma Week. And um, 101 did some insertions off the coast there. That's where the submarine came in. Um, they weren't that successful. Um, it wasn't really their home turf, I would say, although there were Rohingyas and Rakhines who would work with them. Um, the insertions were difficult. And the most disastrous one of them was when um, uh, Eifler himself um, went along on the mission. And after the team went in, a team which would later get caught, uh, he had to take the rubber boats back to the landing craft. And Eifler smashed his head on a rock. Um, this had really lasting effects on him. I mean, he was an eccentric person anyway. You can go to the next slide. Um, you'll see him with a, his pet snake, um, probably pet cobra. <laughs> um, he was eccentric anyway, but after the smashing the head on the rock incident, he became really erratic and um, horrible, horrible head pain. And so he had to be replaced. Um, so that's when, um, Piers took over as a lieutenant colonel at that point, he'd been a lieutenant when he joined up. 
Um, Eifler was given a desk job in Washington. It was a very Eifler-esque desk job. He um, was to plan the kidnapping of a Nazi atomic scientist. So, <laughs> and so he had he had even in that capacity, there were more adventures awaiting him. And then he um, had an, a nice long life after the war. He became a psychologist and um, wrote books, and he was an academic. Um, so unlike Merrill of Merrill's Marauders or Wingate of the Chindits, Eifler did um, survive the war. And Piers um, also had an interesting um, career after the war, and he was uh, the lead investigator on the um, Mile massacre in, um, that happened in Vietnam. Um, he wrote a fantastic book. Um, let's see. There it is. Behind the road. Yep. Um, if you like defeat into victory, um, you'll like Behind the Burma Road. It's really well written. And uh, um, several people in um, OSS 101 wrote memoirs of their experience, but that's kind of the definitive one. Next. So um, they did cooperate with other allied units, um, the Kachin and Chin Levies, the Chindits, and um, Force 136. So they, they worked well with others. Um, they would provide uh, scouting and guide services and even kind of parameter um, fire for different, more traditional units that were well they're not really traditional because they were innovative in their own ways but but large infantry units that were moving through the country next so um i'm always hoping that there was a really good map that the guys in the picture were looking at um as they prepared to move towards michina which is a major town in kitchen land um pretty close to china um, I have a not that great map on the left, um, but it does show these major movements of forces um, at the time. So now we're up to 1944 and the Chindits are the big brown line going deep into the country. And then there is um, X-Force who are Chinese troops under Stillwell, that black line. And the gray line is Merrill's marauders having a horrendous ordeal of fighting their way from place to place to place. And um, 101 was helping out the marauders mostly on the way to Michina. Um, then there are the red lines in there. So you can see at this point, the Japanese aren't in that good a position anymore. You know, they had started out after the invasion, really spreading out all over the country and, you know, in charge of every town, every transport system, and now they're kind of getting cornered. And Michina is a bottleneck because it's where the railway ends and it's where they want to bring the roads through to China. <coughs> so on the way there, a Burmese um, 101 uh, person, um, a radio operator was like a crucial guide and scout, and then a Kachin um, called Now. Um, riding a horse because he'd been bitten by a poisonous snake. Um, he, he really uh, scouted out the airfield at Michina. And so the airfield was the prize. And the marauders were able to take the airfield and with the Chinese troops, I have to emphasize them. It was really mostly the Chinese troops, I think. Um, and then there was this horrible long siege of the town of Michina, but eventually this was a big allied victory and one that OSS had played a part in. And, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's about it's the navigation, isn't it? I mean, that's when, when we, you know, we, we talked before going live, Edith, about the Sam Fuller film, Mera's Marauders and, and, and how unappreciated it is. But in that film, there are Kachins, there are guides there for, you know, showing the Mera's Marauders going to the scouts there. But, when we think of navigation in, in the ETO, for example, we think of being able to take fixed bearings on church towers or bridges. A lot of this is jungle and mountain. So how, how important was the fact there are people on the ground from the OSS and from 101 there actually just being able to navigate? Because 
you know, we're, we're seeing a map where it just looks like this arrow just moves down there. It's it's hard to imagine just how difficult that would be. And you've been, you've been to Myanmar frequently. How how easy is navigation, or rather, how difficult is navigation there even today? Um, well, today there's you know satellite maps and GPS, and people have phones, so it, it might be a little too easy because you can see everybody else's position at all times. Um, but that back then it would be impossible if you weren't from there. And as Paul, you've said before, um, you know it's not remote if you live there. And mm. so you know it's like this is remote northern Burma, but it's also people's homes. So like the the Burmese and Kachin guys, you know, they'd probably been to Michina a million times, you know, for various errands. So they were able to, you know, show people where the good vantage points were. <coughs> um, next slide. So speaking of movies, um, so, you know, after Michina, the, the, the marauders were disbanded after their terrible, terrible ordeals. And I, you know, I just have to contrast the Marauders and the Chinda experience with the OSS experiences. Piers says, um, you know, our guys would come back in rags, you know, from their operations and never a complaint. So there was this really positive um, attitude about it, which may have come from the Kachins in large part. Um, you know, when I was on the march with the contemporary, more contemporary kitchens, you know, they I said they were like, they're living on like bones and weeds with thorns in them. And, you know, they are never complaining or arguing or griping, you know, usually any, any army gripes, but, you know, there was none of that. They were a very cooperative kind of a longhouse culture originally. So um, interpersonal relationships were really important to them. And then, yeah, contrasting to just the the terrible recriminations of the marauders and the, and the chindits to, to some extent um, as to how their units were used during the war. Um, and that's going to have that bearing again. We've talked about it before. That's that acclimatization, isn't it? If if you're a Kachin and you've been there all your life, and your father and your father's father have been there all your life, you, you know you know the terrain. And as we established with with Tony Redding on the Chindits talk, and and Lance Cedric on the LMO Scouts talk a couple of weeks ago, it's that if you as an Allied soldier from the U.S. or Britain arrive in theatre and just get flung straight into the jungle without any time to acclimatize, any time to get used to the, the temperatures, the, the altitudes, the, 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 just the, the, the insects, the, the perils and pitfalls there, of course it's going to be a more, a more physical ordeal than it is if you're already there. And, it's, you know, and, and your experiences there in more recent times with them not being grumbling is because you know, it's their backyard. It's what they're used to, isn't it? So it's... it's as usual on this World War II TV, so much of our experience of what it was like to fight in Burma has been told to us by the Westerners who were in Burma, who are finding the conditions unusual because they're from Kent or they're from Nebraska. So it's it's important to understand, I think, that if you're from that area, your experience is, of course, going to be slightly more positive about the terrain because it's your terrain. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been with other ethnic armies in Burma where where just the usual level of griping um, existed. Okay. <laughs> there was one where, where the officer said, you know, he was so tired of people, you know, bitching and moaning. It was like, we'll sleep here then. And it ended up, you know, we're on a rocky mountainside. So it, it's also cultural, um, but also, you know, in contrast to these larger units like the Marauders, the Marauders had people who were washed up from other outfits because they couldn't get along with people. In it, you know, whereas the OSS um, people were, were highly motivated just to be there. This picture um, has Frank Sinatra in the lead with a bunch of actors playing um, ethnic people from Burma. So the proportions are, are not too bad. It's from a movie called Never So Few, which was based on a novel written by Tom Chambliss, who had been a marauder and joined 101. Um, which, uh, you know, uh, several marauders ended up joining 101. Most of them like, would probably be the last thing that they wanted to do, but some did. 
Never So Few is a truly Rat Pack Hollywood movie. It's got Sinatra. It's got uh, Peter Lawford, Steve McQueen. Um, its virtue is that it does show the role of the kitchens. There are good, real kitchen characters in it. Um, it's lacks of virtue or several. Um, Paul and I agree that the uh, Merrill's Marauder movie by Sam Fuller is really excellent. That's my favorite depiction. Yeah, uh, and never so few is an odd, is an odd fish, isn't it? Because you know when you said earlier about the peacock in the in the Gurkha hat, I mean Frank Sinatra does, ha I believe, yeah. have that in the Absolutely. movie at the beginnings. Yeah, and and so there's elements of that movie that are really quite authentic, and other elements that are just pure Hollywood. But of course, it, it's most interesting now for people who are movie fans to watch it for Steve McQueen, McQueen's breakout performance that earns him, because it was directed by John Sturges, who then John Sturges put him in The Magnificent Seven and then The Great Escape three years later. So it's really the film that propels Steve McQueen to fame. And it was going to be, that was going to be Sammy Davis Jr. playing the role that went to Steve McQueen, but Sammy Davis Jr. fell out with Frank Sinatra and, and Steve McQueen got it and therefore Hollywood legend was born. But we were talking again before going online, folks, about despite its rather clunky um, presentation of, of indigenous people, and George Takai, the, the Japanese-American actor, is, 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 is playing um, uh, um, a Kachin, isn't he? But it does, as you say, it does acknowledge the fact that there were this, there was this force of, of indigenous people alongside the OSS in Burma. So it's clunky, but it does, it does do something to kind of get across that the Burma campaign was multinational. So for that, I think it's worth worth watching and just kind of fast forward for all the romantic bits that are just awful, um, is my advice. <laughs> okay. No, back to reality. Next yeah. slide. Yeah, so I just do like to talk about movies. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, back back to the presentation. Okay. And and I love this picture. Everybody loves this picture. Um and this is a, a Kachin officer um and his buddy, uh an American officer. The Kachin um, Lazum Tong um, outranks the American. And that's something that's significant in 101 is that there were um, quite a few indigenous um, people from Burma um, officers in it. Uh, there was kind of mission creep um, with 101. Um, they seemed to say yes to what anybody asked them to do, even if it was far from their original, like let's gather information and radio it out, or maybe raid some Japanese ammo dumps. Um, and so as Piers was in charge, um, there was just more pressure for them to have an almost infantry-ish role. Um, there were a lot of troops at this point who had signed up with them, um, 10,000 at their max. They started becoming known as the Kachin Rangers around then, um, even though there were many other ethnic groups involved, the Kachins were just kind of the high profile ones. So sometimes you'll see Kachin Rangers as kind of a generic term for um, the 101 troops and um, they were really spread out in the, the sort of northern and Burma and so not just Kachin land but also Shan state and elsewhere and um, supporting roles basically you know this kind of scouting and peripheral ambushes um, that that kind of thing was going on at that point next so what you're sorry just before we move so what you're saying Edith is as, as the war went on they went from being a little bit more irregular and behind the lines and discreet to being a bit more of an organized ground force. Um, because if that is the case, that was happening across World War II with, with the SAS and other formations. As they grew, the, their use became more kind of standardized within the military at, from the early days of it kind of being an old boys club where you just kind of just did your own stuff behind the lines. I'm sure Richard Duckett would add that the same thing is happening with the SOE. It becomes gradually more organized and integral to the, to the military as opposed to kind of a freelance independent unit. And I want to touch again on what you said about the fact there were Kachin officers. Now, I'm sure if we diverted down a rabbit hole, you would say there are other ethnicities in, in Burma that perhaps didn't get the officer representation. But the fact that Kachins did is very, very important because, again, speaking as a Brit, 
Um, Gurkha, actual Gurkha officers were generally white throughout World War II and for a considerable period after World War, after World War II. Most Indian troops were, were led by white officers and very, very few Indian beyond the rank of, a, sort of sergeants and sergeant majors. So the fact that the, the OSS was, was rewarding indigenous people with, with officer ranks and actually in some cases outranking Americans was really really ahead of the game. And um, it, it, kudos to the OSS for allowing that to happen. It was clearly recognition of these people's abilities and, and their integral uh, role within the organizations. Yeah, there was also a Korean um, Detachment 101 officer, Saw Judson, who was um, extremely significant as well and, and worked with SOE. Um, and other units. So yeah, their their abilities were recognized um, during the war, not just, you know. Yeah, and Richard Duckett is confirming there were some in SOE as well. So SOE was yeah. also kind of ahead of the game in that. And um, um, I just had a question coming in there. Just, I'll, I'll address it now from Darren Little, whose grandfather was out in Burma. You may remember Darren joining in the comments on the Burma shows. But um, and maybe Richard Duckett has got a comment on this as well. Was there ever a conflict of in conflict of interest during certain operations between the OSS and SOE? Did they ever get in each other's way? Not that I know of. Um, you know, I've seen examples where they work together, but yeah, Richard would probably be the one you know who's taken a very a deep dive into it um, that might know of that kind of incident. Um, but, well, but yeah, you know, a one hundred and one tended to be pretty unterritorial about what it was doing um you know they, they seem to be like open to just about everything um so one of their more you know traditional roles again or um less uh irregular roles was helping um to take the town of lachio and then when lachio um was in allied hands uh, the split and Richard says yes, there was plenty of friction. So we'll we'll, um, we'll, we'll get Richard on at some point to elaborate on that because that yeah. that sounds really yeah. worth investigating. And uh, yeah, Richard, you're welcome any time on that uh, to talk okay. about that. So um, yeah, well we'll 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 move, we'll move back to presentation. So yeah, this is another interesting and important aspect of it now. I mean, you know, thinking back on it, of course, how how wouldn't there be some territorial um, and you know friction and of course with Stillwell in charge of the Americans uh, and supposedly you know in charge of everybody and his you know anti-British views um, there's probably a certain amount of that came into play too and I guess towards the end of the war when when um, I don't, I don't want to go down too big much of a rabbit hole but towards the end of the war when the outcome of the current conflict is is a little bit more certain, then of course attentions turn to the post-war situation and back to empire and territories and borders and all that. you know the same things happens in Europe towards the end of the war when you know Churchill famously starts thinking about the Soviet Union what have you so I suppose in 42 43 when when things are still on a knife edge organizations are working together much perhaps more harmoniously because they've got the same goal in mind but as you get late 44, 45, perhaps the goals of the various forces, Americans and British, start start deviating slightly in that post. Well, that's a, you know, that will lead us, I guess, to the situation in Myanmar that you'll talk about since World War II. But um yeah, so uh, we'll elaborate on that. But but back to the um the uh the the Burma roads and what have you. So <laughs> um oh and and there were British um personnel in detachment one oh one too who ended yeah, up there yeah. and there. Um, famously, was a, an Irish priest, Catholic missionary priest, and a Scottish Catholic missionary priest who joined up and provided a lot of local knowledge and language skills. Um, but then, yeah, an hour later in the war at Lashio, and then the Lado and and or later called Stillwell Road um, and Burma Roads got linked up. And this is a nice photo op from that um, occurrence with a. African American, Black American um, soldier putting a Chinese flag on the jeep, and a Chinese flag putting an American flag on the jeep, um, showing that they all worked together to make this supply route um, that would go up to Burma, um, from Burma to China. Um, in the 90s, um, in the Kachin Independence Army um, headquarters, where they were fighting the government of Burma. 
I met a major in Chautang who had been with the Kachin uh, levies during the war. And he wrote a pretty fabulous unpublished memoir, which I have. And he spoke about how the local people were delighted when the road um, was built that all you had to do was flag down a Jeep and say, I'm a Kachin, I need to go to, and they would take you there. It's like, this is just amazing to us. We did like free transportation, you know, wherever we wanted to go. And then those Jeeps, um, a lot of them stayed in Burma and became what was called a cooperative Jeep taxi. So you'd have a shared taxi ride in an old American Jeep wherever you wanted to go, at least back in the 80s and 90s. Brilliant. Next. Um, so then um, there was a final mission um, that had the, really the most casualties of anything that 101 did, um, but it earned the multi-ethnic force, which was kind of spelled out in the citation and got a, a presidential distinguished unit citation. Um, medals were handed out, custom made medals and those insignias like we saw at the beginning with the Kachin Rangers, that kind of thing. So there was some recognition then. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, there we go. And um, there was an enormous um, ceremony party. It's called a Manao in um, Kachin land. And uh, in Sha Tang, in his memoir, he, he writes about this fabulous ceremony. And there was this great orator, you know, reciting the ballad of what 101 had done. It's like something from the Iliad, if you experience it. And um, there were flowers everywhere, and the Americans had flash cameras. And he said, I was so overwhelmed and, you know, jolly that I danced for 20 minutes. <laughs> So um, there was this sort of outpouring of, you know, delight at the victory. And um, then there's the, the statistics. And, you know, for 101, I'm not, you know, it's not like it was all a picnic for them. Um, you know, it was definitely not the ordeal that other units had in Burma, but bad things happened. Terrible things happened to people in the forests and mountains of Burma. Um, including the enemy, as they were called, the Japanese. So 101 killed, yeah, they, they are accounting in Pierre's book, um, 5,428 known enemy. That's awfully precise because there are a lot of unknown. They captured 75, which one of them was a downed Japanese pilot who, you know, he didn't give up information willingly, but he had some photos on him. This is pretty early in um, 101's operation. He had photos that showed how the Japanese camouflaged their airfields. So this was super, super good intelligence. So it was sort of like, if that was all they had done, you know, that was a pretty good feat, you know, getting a hold of that. <clears throat> and then the um, other side of the statistic is, yeah, fewer than 300 of its own people um, of Detachment 101 were killed, captured, or missing in action. So, and, and given that they, uh, they were 10,000 approximately their peak, that yeah. is that's remarkably low for, for a theater that was known for, for, for yeah. forget just loss of life to enemy action, just loss of life to de disease, infection, the, yeah, the, the perils, as we talked about earlier, of, of just dealing with the terrain there. And it's a testament, therefore, to what you were saying earlier about their incredible dependence on those in, indigenous people, the Kachins and the Karens and what have you, to, to acclimatize them and to make sure they were best suited that environment and moving through it correctly and doing their job as as these discrete units should be doing with with it's about intelligence gathering and rescuing down airmen it's not necessarily about blowing things up it's about giving the the rest of the allied army this this fighting advantage and richard duckett thought, talked about the same thing with the soe back in burma week this they're not there to win the battles they're there in a sense to give the allies extra information intelligence and and um uh, information to help them in their engagements with the enemy and so yeah but extraordinary statistics and um yeah you, I'm, I'm with you it's a very precise number of of known enemy deaths there that seems a little bit too 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 neat but um uh, they, they say there was an accounting system um involving ears but 
you know. Okay, well, well, that's a story yes. that comes up in you know lots of different theaters of operations. So I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, I mean, some of these kitchen raiding parties were really elite kill units. I mean, they were they were really lethal on Japanese jungle patrols. Um, so they they punched above their weight, as the cliche goes. Um, and, you know, and then I just add on to that, of course, the zero parachute jump um, yeah. fatalities or casualties. So, so all in all, a um, pretty impressive outcome. Next. Well, I remember talking with Richard when he was on, and I, I think I remember talking with Richard about the fact that there's probably a less information from what from the Japanese side about exactly how much effect this had morale wise, psycho psychologically on the Japanese forces is in, in that idea that if you're a Japanese unit in the jungle, that wherever you can be, wherever you might be, there might be some insurgent force that get you're not you're not safe anywhere. You're, anything you build, anything you transport, there's always a danger of of some local unit, an OSS or SOE or or locally raised, you know, causing damage against you. It, it sets that fear, you know, because you know we we tend to think of Burma as as battles but in some ways it's like you know the japanese are occupying a country it's like france or norway there's there's japanese troops in burma occupying it in the early you know 42 particularly and if you can instill in the enemy a fear that wherever you are you're in danger that that's going to have an effect it's going to have an effect on how many japanese you know do they do they go if they're taking a truck of supplies, do they always have an armed escort, for example, if they're, if they're thinking that they're going to be ambushed on these jungle trails, if there's always fear of ambush, fear of, you know, that, that kind of effect psychologically probably hasn't been measured properly, but maybe in, in years to come, people will understand, investigate the Japanese archives more and get some of that. That would be fascinating to know, I think. Well, and of course, that's how the Japanese were perceived at the beginning of the war was that they were the formidable people traveling through the forests and could attack you at any time. Um, you know, and then it should be emphasized that not everybody, you know, this was not Norway, you know, the local population, a lot of them were for the Japanese, you know, yeah. they were getting rid of the colonists, at least initially, um, you know, then the Burma, army itself turned against the Japanese later in the war, which is important, but, but there were whole ethnicities who were not entirely, but perceived as backing the Japanese versus these ones that we've been talking about, like the Kachins and the, the Karens, Chins, um, who backed the allies. So yeah, good point. Yeah. There was a civil war aspect to it and still is. So yeah, then the war ended, you know, and a few people got medals um, and went back to their mountain villages. And um, unfortunately, the Burmese army, which had been trained by the Japanese Kempitai, um, dating back to that, to the Japanese Secret Service um, during World War II, they gradually took more power. And in 1962, they imposed a dictatorship on the entire country, which lasted decades and decades and decades. And um, it's now it's back um, as of February 1st. Um, so the allies, you know, they were just kind of let the, left on their own, the people who had fought, you know, on the British American ally side. And then there were some great efforts by 101 veterans during the late 90s under really, really difficult conditions for this kind of thing, because the regime in Burma was not welcome to foreign meddling or foreign aid or anything like that. But um, Peter Lipkin, Lipkin and uh, Roger Hillsman were instrumental in agricultural programs and schools that are still functioning up in Kitchen land. And then of course I have to put in a plug um, for Help for Forgotten Allies, which is a British organization which does amazing work with um, surviving uh, people from Burma, from Myanmar um, and their families, um, surviving people who were allied uh, soldiers during the war. Um, you know, they're very deserving of support as an organization. And next. 
Um, so as we've, we've mentioned a few times in the presentation, uh, the war is still going on, or a war is still going on with a lot of direct links to World War II. Um, here are some soldiers that I met at that frontline base in 1991, and they have their improvised weaponry as well as their regular weaponry. Um, oh yes, the Kohima Trust, a really excellent um, organization, endorsed that as well for sure. Um, amazing educational work um, and other help in that, that region bordering Burma or Myanmar as it's called now by some people. So um, yeah, there's a punji stick there. There's the triple punji stick, which they told me was innovative at the time. Um, there's a rock stuffed with explosive. There's lots of other things stuffed with explosive, including a Heineken beer can uh, grenade, handmade grenade. Um, I think it was picked because it was green. Um, and, you know, they, they have just been fighting generation after generation um, against the intrusion and human rights violations of the military um, that's been in charge of that country. And um, they still honor their relationship with um, their World War II allies. You know, when I was there, there would be older people who would, you know, ask me if I knew, you know, Charlie from Cincinnati or, you know, they, they would literally know people's names and remember them as, you know, <clears throat> you'll find that with other, you know, units where there were the Chindits or 136, there would be people who would still really remember the war um, firsthand. Um, now, of course, it's our grandparents, parents, mm. great grandparents, um, Generation and you know a tragic thing is happening in in Myanmar and Burma now, which is that not only was there the the coup d'état, which has been met with a general strike since February, um, but COVID nineteen is really really rampaging through the country. The Delta variant is just cutting a, a swath through. So day after day, people's grandparents and great grandparents are dying from it. Um, just a whole generation of artists and poets and intellectuals is gone right now. Um, and so my hopes for, you know, there being World War II veterans, you know, left to tell the tale, it's kind of getting slimmer, even though a lot of the Kachins and Karens and Chins and others were, were pretty young. They were teenagers when they were at war. Still the, the utter lack of health care in the country is making their survival rate much, much less uh, present, unfortunately. Next. <coughs> now this picture was um, when I was up at the Kachin Independence Army headquarters in um, 2011. It was kind of interesting and all those pictures of like uh, American and a uh, Kachin, you know, you can see a big height disparity there. And when I was there in 1991, you know, I at five foot three was considered this great hulking creature. <laughs> just so tall, you know, and they try to like find somebody tall for me to take a picture with. And um, so then I went back there in 2011 and there had been a ceasefire for, uh, you know, years and years. And then the war had started up again. And these women soldiers were, uh, the same height as me, or maybe even a little taller, you know, so the, the, you hear the term peace dividend, it really exists. Um, people had actually gotten healthier and the children were, their growth rate was stronger and people were literally had gotten taller um, since the, you know, generations that had grown up in a war zone. And um, so there's my shout outs to the, some of the really good books, obviously the peers with Dean Brellis, um, Memoir of the War, uh, Richard Dunlop, who is in 101, wrote Behind Japanese Lines, which is an amazing source of photos. Um, I think many of which came from peers own collection. Um, Tom Moon, who is in 101, <coughs> wrote a biography of Eiffler. And uh, Troy Sakitty um, has done a huge amounts of research, just brilliant, brilliant stuff on the organization of the unit and blog posts on every possible aspect. Um, 
and then of course Richard Duckett and Robert Lyman, shout out. Um, my uh, Burma reports, um, links to my Twitter history threads that I do every month about different aspects of Burma are all at projectmaji.org. It's M-A-J-E dot org. And the link is in the description below, below folks, if you need to find that. And then one more slide. So during the crisis with the horrendous COVID pandemic in a place with really, you know, no health infrastructure, plus the civil disobedience movement trying to get rid of the Burmese dictatorship um, once and for all through non-cooperation. Um, a way to support those efforts is I support Myanmar.com. And that's kind of a clearinghouse with lots of different options for things that you can support from healthcare to civil disobedience um, campaigners. Well, well, thank you for sharing that with us, Edith. And I really want to tap into your knowledge now as we kind of bring things to an end, because in, in an odd way, lots of people could have come forward and done a presentation about the OSS because there's people out there who've read about it widely. What's unique about your experience is, of course, you've been there, you've lived, you've traveled there, you've walked these areas. And that's that's the insight that as my, I know Robert Lyman has been to the area a couple of times and, and, and others have, but it's your insight there. So we've talked a lot, you know, we had South Asia, Southeast Asia History Week. We talked a lot about this resurgence of interest in India, for example, about their participation in World War II and, and, and a real sense of, of revolution in the sense that we're, we're going to be hearing about the war from people who aren't white, the people who were based there. I know, of course, things are very difficult in the region now, but without dismissing that, but putting aside that as a separate horrible tragedy right now, having been there, you know, you said there, you know, people ask if you knew Harry from Cincinnati and, and Bob from Chicago. Do you, the, the, obviously the people from that region have a deep interest in their past. What's your kind of takeaway from being there about, about, I know there's been multiple experiences and different people you meet, but th th there's obviously still a sense of pride of what they achieved. There's still a fierce sense of, a sense of independence, but what are your takeaways about the, from the people these days? Yeah, there is a sense of independence and there's independences within independence. So there are people who want to be autonomous or even independent from the country as outlined by the British colonists. Um, and then there's also the sense of pride that we are post-colonial, um, that we are an independent land. Um, now there's really, I'm seeing a big resurgence of interest in the history of Burma from people who are from there. Um, internet access has been very much curtailed since the coup d'etat in February, but people are still trying to reach out and learn as much background as they can. And there are even elements of things like the history of sabotage in Burma that are directly relevant to what people's defense forces are doing absolutely at this moment in Burma. So they're looking to the past for examples of things like strategy even, as well as just you know a sense of the, the meaning of what is our story. Our story is not necessarily what the military of the country under dictatorship has told us is our story for years. Um, the educational system, the publishing system, all of that was very suppressed under the military dictatorship. So there will be much more by people from Burma coming out. Um, in recent years, there have been many more memoirs from people from the different ethnic groups of Burma, which has been fantastic to just watch that blossoming. Um, Burmese poetry is being translated. All of that is, is really happening culturally. And before the coup, there was a kind of a cultural literary flowering in Burma. Um, things were by no means perfect. And the Rohingya genocide happened, you know, during this period of this loosening up, so-called. But there, there was a lot going on. Um, some years ago, I reviewed a Burma Road book that somebody had written and, you know, in their notes in, to the book, they said, oh, they did, you know, these hundreds of interviews in Burma. Uh, 
and then in the book itself they had they didn't have one single account or name even of you know somebody from there saying this is what happened this was our experience during that time so that you know that's kind of the what not to do um i think in the future there would just have to be a lot more firsthand even though those people are kind of dying out they like in Chuatang, you know have left memoirs and notes and letters and things that were not necessarily published um during that generation the the world war ii generation in burma a lot of people spoke english really really well um those people would be my translators when i was traveling around there in the, the 90s and 2000s um so it's not even that there's always a language barrier on it you know you can you can definitely find more information about the war in burma from burma and in burma um once the current double situation of pandemic yeah. and and coup d'etat crackdown or but, but i think i just said that that will hopefully be the 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 result of of changes is that instead of people from outside of Burma talking about them for for them, they'll be speaking with their own voice about their own experience. Okay, it might be second or third hand. It'll be grandkids talking about what their grandfathers and grandmothers did, but it'll still be from the areas as opposed to, you know, Westerners talking about it from their points of view. And it's not that we're the Western points of view are wrong. And when we when we did Burma Week and Tim Tim Garung came on and talked about the Gurkhas, there are some cracking books by white British authors about the Gurkha battalions and regiments in World War One and World War Two, but at the same time, how wonderfully refreshing it is to have a Gurkha historian talk about Gurkhas as opposed to a white person. I think that's the, and Richard Duckett, I'm sure, would agree that hopefully in the, in years to come, Rich will be able to make more contact with Burmese or Myanmar students, students of history, people who are investigating the past, and it will be a and a, a collaborative uh, um, examination of World War II from, from both of these cultures, and indeed the, bringing the Japanese experience into things as well. The, the the enemy then, but they have their experience of the war in the theatre as well. So I think you know we Robert Lyman, James Holland, those who have written great books about Burma, we're glad they have. But I'm looking forward in five years, ten years time to the to the definitive history of Burma in World War II by some as yet unfamous Burmese author who will be at that time a household name. Everyone say, oh, if you're reading about Burma, you must read the book by and there'll be some 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 historian that that yeah that will that will emerge from this from this this dark past. But um it's been great talking to you, um, Edith. And you know, and Richard is saying there, you know, it was beginning to happen, but the coup, you know, the coup set things back, and that that is the tragedy there. And this is, <laughs> I think, circling back to what we started about the beginning is that I'm hoping some of the people who are watching this show today and those who catch up watching it over the next few days and weeks will will ex will will take on board the idea that World War II didn't end neatly for everybody in 1945. It ended for some people, but it didn't end for others. And I think that connecting of World War II with current affairs is so very important. I don't really want to become a channel where we're always talking about current affairs. I asked Kevin Maher about the, the situation in Afghanistan uh, last week because he'd been there. But you know, I will be firmly rooted in talking about the past. But in talking about the past, you have to appreciate the understanding today and how the past is still affecting today. And I think that's where, you know, your experience of, of, of being there and, and knowing these people is so important. And, and, I, and I hope that the people from that area will be, be discovering my channel and discovering your work and your blog. And, 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 and they'll realize that we are interested and we do have an appreciation for what the people of Burma were, were doing then and what they're experiencing now, tragically. So, um, well, there we are, folks. We've got, as I say, I encourage you to, to, to check out those links, either shared with us there, look into what you can do to, to, to look at Burpee, like Darren, whose grandfather were there. You know, our British relatives came back home from that campaign. But that, as we said, those people who were there, they had to endure hardships and tribulations for, for as you said, decades and are still, still, still effectively fighting a different type of war. But the a lot of the themes and the things are same, the same. So, yeah, as people have said, they're fascinating episode, fascinating level of detail, and that's it. So we're, we're, we're pleased. So um, 
I'll just remind people what we've got coming up, and then I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second, Edith. So, folks, we have uh, I'm doing nothing tomorrow. I've got a bit of a day off. Um, i do some traveling around with, with Mag. And then Thursday, we begin again. Well, we begin Holocaust Week. So my first presentation with Dr. Chris Millington is we're talking about the Holocaust in France. Then we'll be moving through and, uh, and doing those other shows that will be covering a wide range of subjects with regards to the Holocaust, some some uh, uplifting shows and some perhaps less less uplifting but important because understanding and and uh, and and being aware of the horrors of the Holocaust need sometimes to, to be confronted with the hard, cold, rather nasty facts of it. And uh, so we'll be covering that later on. As usual, folks, don't forget to check us out on Patreon. I could still do with some more patrons. Don't forget to share what we're doing with your friends on social media. Help, out, help us out by retweeting what we tweet on Twitter sharing messages on Facebook and just telling people what we're up to here because I think what we're doing here is very important. But those who are with us, thank you for my new to my new patrons. Thank you for those of you who do come and join us every time we do a show. I very much appreciate it and I I I am I'm very um uh, humbled by your loyalty. Thank you very much for that. So right now it remains me to say thank you very much to Edith for joining us and I hope you will go viewers will go and check out Edith's blog and her and her writing about Burma because it is fascinating and if you want to have, hear a bit more of Edith's opinions there's loads of things on YouTube where she has talked about the country in recent times political upheavals that you you are considered someone to go and speak to when people want commentary about Burma so I'm very grateful that you you took your time out to join us on World War II TV so did you enjoy it Edith? Thank you so much no shortage of opinions here um, no, definitely. You're doing just a fantastic thing. You know, story after story is being told here, and um, it's an ongoing uh, situation in so many places. Well, thank yeah, you. Indeed, and as I say, this is a, a hard reminder today that the, the, the effects of World War II are, are not over for some people, and that's going to be my takeaway from today's show is that. You know, I, 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 as I said, I'd repeat myself, but I think of World War II as being a closed book, but actually, for the people of Myanmar, it's still very much current affairs, albeit different conflict, different name, but it's the same struggles against against oppressive um, regimes, and, and, and that is important. So there we are, folks. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV. I will see you all again on Thursday for Holocaust Week. Thank you very much for your time.